I'm 2023 Daytona 500 winner, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., and you're watching Cup Connection. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cup Connection. I'm Mike Massaro. We believe and we believe today. Those were the words written on the roll bars inside Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s car last Sunday. A reminder to Stenhouse that his team was 100% behind him and that perhaps they sensed that something special could happen. Indeed, it did. Stenhouse, who some may have considered an underdog coming into the race, won an overtime Daytona 500 that finished under caution. There was lots of genuine emotion in Victory Lane, and it has not subsided much since. Earlier this week, I was able to catch up with Ricky Stenhouse Jr., and as you might imagine, it's been a busy week for the Daytona 500 champion, but when he says he's available for an interview, what do you do? You drop everything and get right to it, which is exactly what we did, despite not being in the studio. So excited now to catch up with this year's Daytona 500 champion, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Great to see you here. Congratulations. What's this been like for you? Uh, it's been a, a roller coaster. Uh, you know, tired, uh, super excited, a lot of media, which is which has been really fun. Uh, you know, to help promote our sport, promote the you know 75th year of you know, NASCAR and, you know, promoting uh, this team, uh, JTG Doherty Racing, uh, everybody, uh, you know, at, at the Kroger company who, um, you know, all of our partners, man, there's so many great things that have come out uh, just, you know, last few days. Uh, we still got a rest of the week to go, but man, it's been, it's been really fun. Uh, we're finally back here at the shop, being able to see the crew guys, the ones that are you know in the shop working that, that weren't at the racetrack uh it's it, life is good well uh, congratulations again so much to unpack from this uh, let's talk about the race itself the way it finished crash comes yellow comes out the race is basically decided based upon when the yellow flew what are your thoughts at that point in time when when it wasn't decided yet yeah, I knew, or at least I felt confident that we were out front when the caution came out. Like I, that wasn't a big concern for me. My biggest concern was trying to talk to the team like, hey, I know we took the white, the race is over. Do we, what, what do we have to do? Like, all I gotta do is get back to start finish line. Like, what's the scenario here? Because I was close to being out of gas and, that was all I was concerned about was like getting like, what do I got to do to complete this race? Like I got to get another half a lap around to the, the start finish line, make sure we, you know, maintain speed. You know, the caution car was not out there yet. So I wasn't sure how fast to go. Things like that were running through my head. Going back and looking at when the caution came out, it was a lot closer than I felt like it was. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, speedway racing, uh, NASCAR racing in general, game of inches, obviously. So, um, you know, we were we were ahead, you know, at the right time. So I, this is such a great moment for this team. You talked about JTG Doherty Racing and, and how it's impacted them. What's the journey been like for this organization to get to this point where you could win the, rate, the, the NASCAR series, the Cup Series biggest race? Well, I think it's just a lot of hard work. I mean, you look at all the roles that, you know, Tad and Jody have played, um, you know, throughout their career uh, on the team uh, and, the, and the roles they still play. Uh, we got, you know, Brad Doherty, Gordon Smith, uh, also that, uh, you know, have roles to play in this team. And, you know, it takes, it takes all different aspects uh, of an organization to be able to win a race like the Daytona 500 and you got to have great partners and we do in in Kroger, uh, Cottonelle, all the all the brands that are on our car throughout the season. We have a lot. We rotate through a lot of them. And, you know, so that's just part of it. And then you got these race team guys who are making a lot of noise in the shop right now, but um, they're they're reminiscing. You know, the, the hard work that they put in, uh, they're they're grinding. Um, you know, they were working on Saturdays this off season, making sure everything was perfect going down, you know, to the Great American Race, the Daytona 500, uh, our Super Bowl, um, you know, and it's just amazing to get them in victory lane, to see how excited these crew guys were when I got back to the race shop today. Uh, that's what it's all about. But just a lot of hard work. 
uh, from all different aspects of this race team. Watching the broadcast, we heard your crew chief, Mike Kelly, tell you to, to look up at the roll bar, see a message that was there. Had you seen that message before that moment? I did. I, I saw. So when I got in, um, you know, the car, you know how uh, our sport works, Mike, there, there's, it, there's so much chaos around you at the start of these races with driver intros, drivers meetings, um, you know, pictures by the car with your sponsors and your family. Yeah, you know, there's just a lot of stuff going on. So when I got in the car and you know, kind of get in like a little quiet place, right? Like, you know, you turn the switch and, and that's kind of like game mode. I sat down in the car, I was buckling my seatbelts and, you know, I looked up and, and I saw the note and I, nothing was said. And, um, you know, when we sped on pit road, Mike was like, Hey, you know, the caution had come out. We were under caution. He's like, Hey, Look at your roll bar, left you a note. You know, we still believe you can do this. You know, we we have an opportunity. Let's go get it right. And um, you know, that's that's the motto Mike has. He I feel like he believes in me more than I believe in myself, and he does that with all these crew guys. And I feel like you know that's a sign of a, a really good coach, a really good team leader, um, and and something that you know crew chiefs need. Um, you know, the cars are similar now. It's how you get the most out of your people. And, and Mike believes in every single one of us here. He's made us believe, um, you know, in each other. And, you know, this is basically the same group of guys we had last year, but the off season just felt different. Uh, I felt like everybody was more prepared, more focused and uh, more confident going in, um, you know, to the season. Yeah. It's only, you know, we're only two races in um, one points race in still a lot of racing left, but uh, you know, we got a great team leader now. So let's look ahead to some of those races. Of course, the, the next one coming up, having this victory under your belt, how does this change your outlook going forward? Probably a little more relaxed, you know, and which I think for me could probably be a good thing. You know, you, you're not so on edge of, hey, we we have to win this race or we need to win this race or, you know, we we need to finish top five. We, we got to get a top 10. I feel like you know, Saturday's practice session is going to be a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more fun, but also, you know, I feel like, I feel like that is going to help us, you know, just enjoy, enjoy the process. We've, we've got a lot of things to accomplish this year. We want to raise that's, that's checked off. We want to win another one. You know, we felt like, you know, there was really good racetracks for us last year, not just Daytona, that we have opportunities to win at this year. Uh, but the main thing that we set out to do this year was be more consistent. Take our bad races, which was mainly on the short tracks last year, elevate that program while you know maintaining where we were uh, on the mile and a half racetracks. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm pumped up, you know, to exclude Daytona, I've been pumped up for this season to get to some of these racetracks, especially on the West Coast Swing, I love Fontana. I love Las Vegas. And uh, I, I'm excited to get back into the race car. Understandably so. You know, one of the other aspects of this is unless something completely un unforeseen happens, you're in the playoffs. No other sport can say that after week one, you're in the playoffs. So how does that change things? Well, I mean, again, you know, I think that's and and I heard Mike Kelly talk about this. We are going to act as if we don't have that in our back pocket right now. We want to we want to take these next 25 races and whether it be point your way in. We know that if we average a 14th, 15th place finish in the next 25 races, we will have an opportunity to make the playoffs based on points. And so we want to prepare. We want to act like that, you know, moving forward, just in case, you know, there is a crazy circumstance where, you know, you do have more winners and you do um, you do end up needing some other way to get in the playoffs. Right. So, you know, we we're excited. Yes. Right now we're, we are in the playoffs, but, um, you know, there's still 25 races to go, Mike. And, and we we got a lot of focus on those. Seems like a great attitude, Ricky. Again, congratulations. We appreciate the time today and good luck in Fontaine. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, considering the fact that I used to do interviews at helicopter pads outside of racetracks, that setting, not too bad. Thank you to Ricky for giving us some of his valuable time. Of course, joining in the Daytona celebration was his crew chief, Mike Kelly. 
You just heard Rick talk about his importance to the team and to him personally. For Kelly, it has been quite a journey, and Sunday's victory has deep meaning for so many reasons. Reasons that he discussed with us. Joining us now is Daytona 500 winning crew chief, Mike Kelly. Mike, thanks for being with us. Congratulations. Has it set in yet? Yeah, it did. You know, it uh, it, it didn't all happen Sunday night, you know, because you're just so busy and you're, you're uh, we actually didn't leave the track till one o'clock. Tech's a long time. You know, they, they want to make sure they got it right. Tech is a four or five hour process for the 500. They don't take the car back home and tear it apart. We have to do it there because you get to put your car in Daytona, USA the next day. So, so really you, you enjoy it. You take a lot of pictures and you wear a lot of champagne and uh, a lot of hugs and kisses and high fives, but it actually set in for me the next morning when we were doing the, um, the, the, the champions breakfast with Ricky and, and the guys and, uh, and, and back in victory lane, um, it hit me and I got a little emotional. I was talking to uh, Lee Spencer and, and it got a little emotional then. I think that's when it started hitting me and we flew home Monday afternoon and we had no idea. We landed in Concord airport at the FBO and our, our entire shop and families were all there, uh, on the tarmac waiting on us. They had a police, police cars with sirens going and more champagne and more confetti. <laughs> and, uh, I, c- I couldn't have came home to a better group. You know, a lot of folks don't know your history, but I do. I mean, I, I, I know you've gone through some highs. You've also gone through some very lows. Mm-hmm. Considering all that, what does this mean to you? It, it means a lot to me for different reasons than it would maybe to somebody else who won it. Just because of what you said, the, uh, I was, I was fortunate. I was able to move up here uh, 27 years ago and get started in on the floor of a, of a small truck team owned by Ernie Irvin and work your way to, you know, if you want to say work your way to the top, that was my goal. I told my mom and dad when I left Florida that I wasn't just coming to do this to do this, that I had, I had goals and, and dreams that I wanted to accomplish and set, set timelines on those so that I knew if I was on track or off track. And, uh, Man, I was really fortunate that by by 2000, 2001, I kind of started started seeing a true path to getting where I wanted to go. And I was I got a phone call from Dale Earnhardt, incorporated by Ty Norris to come be the car chief at uh, DEI in the fall of 2000. And that that really started started pulling myself up the ladder. And we all know the story, right? 2001, um, I was on the team that won the 500 really fortunate michael's first race uh with us and we won the 500 and and 25 30 minutes later we found out that our our boss our friend our owner uh passed in a tragic accident um iconic to the sport so it kind of shut it all down immediately as 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 fast as the highs came you you couldn't celebrate and and still to this day that's the right decision for what we went through but for 20 years you, you know, you look at the ring every now and then and you and, and the, all the guys that were on that team, we know each other and we, we know what it's about. But for 20 years, you, you didn't you never got to celebrate that. And uh, I went through the cup garage for a while and, and worked on some really successful teams. I was fortunate enough to win a cup championship pretty early in my career with Kurt Busch. And uh, Jack elevated me to a sanity crew chief. And in a few years, we were winning races and got paired with Ricky and won a couple of championships. But I didn't know that I would ever go back to the cup garage. I didn't know if I wanted to go back to the cup garage. Um, and I did. I went with Ricky in 14. And I just wasn't ready. I had spent too much time away from the cup garage. And and our our performance of our vehicles wasn't as good as it needed to be for an inexperienced crew chief. I couldn't, I couldn't make a big enough difference. And uh, I, I felt like I was just struggling. Um, Asked Jack to take me back out of that role and uh, put me in a, a role where I could learn more about the cup cars. And and I just I just bounced around for a few years where I got some really good offers on some deals, but my heart wasn't in it to go do it. And I told myself that unless the right deal came along, I I just would I would just continue, whether it was a in charge of an aero department or I ended up being the competition director over here at JTG. So uh, luckily I got an offer. We started talking about it late last season to get paired back up with Ricky. And that was that was one of a few opportunities that I would I would ever accept again, like that I would I would think about. So 
to get paired back up with him and then roll into Daytona and to to race that race with him and come out on top. It's it's in, it's a man. I I joke with my PR girl all off season saying, you know, I'm going to practice my speech. I'm going to practice because I feel I feel that good about it. Um, and really, it was just talk. You're right. It's we we know how hard it is to win this race. I've watched some of the best never win it. I've watched. Uh, some guys so close. Ricky was so close last year, right? He's five laps away from, and he's leading it at the time. It's not like he's we're not front tenth. He's leading and gets wrecked from behind. And for us, a small team to be able to pull it off, um, I, I don't know that I'll ever put it into words, and I'm okay with that. All right. So um, I want to get to one thing that, that a lot of people are talking about. It caught my attention immediately when uh, the audio was played during the broadcast. You told Ricky to look at his roll bar. Yeah. The message there was, we believe. You had obviously written that. Did you write it yourself, by the way? Yes, sir. Yep. Why? I want to know why. Why you wrote that thing. So, this Daytona was different for me. Over the last 20 years, you go down there. And whether I'm in whatever role I'm in, it's Daytona. And it didn't matter if I was a competition director, if I was in charge of the arrow, if I was a car chief the butterflies and the anticipation of Daytona overwhelm you literally until the drop of the green flag. And I, I, I even I explained it to my wife. I'm not going to lie. When I, when I left to go to the plane, I was nervous. Once I got in the garage, I felt oddly calm. And probably because how bad we qualified, <laughs> it, it changed it, right? It was instead yeah. of if we would have qualified really well, I hate to say it this way. I don't know that we would have worked as like we did not go to bed till one o'clock after Wednesday night qualifying because we, we wanted answers. Our team wanted answers. We knew what we had done to get the, where we were and it just it didn't add up. So we worked super hard. We got back up at six o'clock Thursday morning, went to work. And for the rest of that weekend, it was just oddly calm for me for a 500. And I remember uh, we got up Sunday morning. I woke up at three thirty, not not because I was nervous, just because I was ready. I felt like I like I was ready for today. I knew how good our car was Friday night, and um, I went to the track. Me and my wife and the guys. I forgot to shave, <laughs> so I went back out to my uh, to my minivan and got my my aftershave case out, and I went into one of those bathrooms in the infield and I remember the fans looking at me and I just was like you know what I'm just shaving I'm, I'd rather be clean shaven on race day than them guys making fun of me later that they saw me shaving um and the rest of the day was just calm so as the race was getting ready to go there was so many people on pit road one of the last things I did was I, I asked one of the guys for a sharpie and I just tore a piece of orange tape out of the bag and, and I, I just wrote we believe and we believe today and I just wanted him to know that this group 45 people strong believed in his ability and what we were doing as a group and all off season, that was our mantra. And that came from, we, we took over this huge process to build this pit box from scratch. Ernie Cope challenged us to build this pit box. He wanted it the biggest and best on pit road because being a single car team, we struggled to get people on top of the pit box. So we built a pit box that seats 21 people. As we were building this pit box, there was one piece of aluminum at the top of the pit box that needed a cap on it. And an engineer came up to me and said, what do you think about putting John 316 on it or something? What do you think about putting some message in it? And I said, okay, print me a cap and put in there the words we believe. And I hammered that cap in there on a late night in January. And I just told everyone that that's us. Just believe in the system. So when we would have meetings, when I would send out tweets during the winter or text messages to my guys or to Ricky, whether he was on vacation or I was, I would just finish it off by saying, just believe. We believe. Hashtag we believe. Not that I'm trying to create something, but it, just to reinforce it, how much we believe. And I hadn't thought about it all weekend, literally until three minutes, four minutes before he got in the car. I think he, he ran off to use the bathroom one last time. And I put it in there and I didn't say nothing. I didn't need to say nothing to him. I had done that before in our careers when he had gone through some tough times or, or, or our company or our team. Just, just something to reaffirm him that he's not alone. The one thing I learned early in racing is that driver, a lot of times when that helmet's on and it's tight and it's hot, most of the time no one's talking to him. 
And most of the time he has to complain to get his car better and he, he'll feel like he's alone. I just wanted to reassure him that today for the biggest race of our year, he was not. He had all of us and we believed in him. Incredible story, Mike. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I want to, I want to move ahead here a little bit. Um, we spoke with Ricky yesterday and I mentioned to Ricky uh, how valuable it was to, to get this win and essentially qualify for the playoffs. But what he pointed out to us was that you immediately have told the team not to get complacent. No. What's no. it going to be like trying to keep this motivation as high as it is right now? It's, it's reality versus possibility and understanding what we have, right? So we do have a golden ticket per se, right? We, we have an opportunity to, to be among the elite 16 per, in, in the playoffs. But we also saw last year how many different winners there were. And it, it came down to, I think, a guy who finished fourth in points missed the playoffs. So we are, we're not guaranteed anything. Mathematically says, based on statistics, we'll be, we'll be in. But Ricky Stenhouse wasn't picked to win this race. Chris Buescher nope. wasn't picked to win after the chase last year. And, and I thought I saw a stat this morning that 22 different winners have won in the last season to now. So there, mm -hmm. there's a chance it, it will take two wins or be a, be a high as you can in the points with one win. And that's what I told him immediately. I said, we are, the only thing we have guaranteed is that we did win and we are locked into the all-star race, which means a lot to me and to a lot of people, but we are playing with house money and have the ability to put ourselves in position, but you cannot lose sight of it. You, if you go into this weekend and DNF, your average finish for two races is 17th. And that, that's nothing to write home about. So we have to still perform at a higher level than they, I, I still feel, and this is what we worked on all week, and trying trying to minimize the distractions of being the 500 week and race winners and focus on getting the Fontana car and Vegas cars out the door properly prepared by Tuesday night at midnight after being in Daytona all day Monday was a chore for a small team. That's the struggle with a small team. You just don't have as many hands and, and mm -hmm. minds. Um, but yeah, so we cannot get complacent. We, we pray that, and I, I'm, I am not in disbelief that we can't win another race in this, in this next 24 races. And I'm not even including speedways. Ricky ran really well at this track last year. He ran really well at Kansas and he's ran well at Texas last year in Dover. They finished second. I'm not, I'm not expecting to win a, a bunch of races. I, I no one person has that kind of ability to turn things that fast, but I believe I can take the lows away easy, right? Take, take all the DNFs out, try and concentrate on that side of it. And then we'll be, we should be fine with the points. Let, let the points lay where they are and we'll have an opportunity to win at Atlanta and we'll have an opportunity to win at Talladega. And when we go back to Daytona and in August, we'll have an opportunity there, but so will everybody else. All right, Mike, just to wrap this up. West Coast swing. How do you look at the next few races? Same. So before we started this, I told Ricky, I said, the first four races of this season are the most important to me because they were races that we had the ability last year. We, we were leading the 500. We finished, I think, seventh or eighth in Fontana and ran up, ran up there all day. In Vegas, we had a 12th place car, but put ourselves in position to be in the top I think we were seventh with 40 to go and uh, we, we lost an engine and finished 19th or something. But the one that stuck out to us was Phoenix and Phoenix. We struggled and we struggled worse then in the fall than we did in the spring. So we worked, we have worked from the time I took this job over, we have worked on all our weaknesses. The most we spent a lot of time on Phoenix. We actually got to go test at Phoenix. We've spent, hundreds of laps on the simulator our realistic goals are to go play 15th or better the next three weeks right if we can if we can hit those goals and those to me aren't aren't a stretch right everyone is wanting to see what happens to us now right there's a lot of naysayers that will say 
They don't want a 27th place points car in the chase. My goal is to say that we've earned our way into the chase and prove that we, we belong to be there. So top 15 the next three weeks, top 10s if we can grab a couple, and man, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be set to start, start fighting hard the next few weeks after that. All right, well, keep the momentum going. Uh, yeah. A lot of people are pulling for you. You know, they, they like that small team that wins the huge race, which is That's exactly right. what you did. So we wish you the best of luck going to Fontana and beyond. Hope to talk to you again before the end of the year, Mike. All right, anytime. We appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Well, with Daytona now in the rear view mirror, it's time to turn the page. Race two is when the series gets into the more, shall we say, fundamental style of racing that makes up the bulk of the schedule. Fontana is next, and it could be a bit sentimental for some. After all, it is the last race there under the current two-mile configuration. After this week, it'll be converted to a short track. Some drivers to watch out for this weekend? Well, let's begin with Kyle Busch. He is a four-time winner at Auto Club Speedway, and now we saw his debut with RCR last week, and it certainly seems like it's been a seamless transition. From one Kyle to the next, how about Kyle Larson? He could be tough to beat this weekend. He's won there twice, including a year ago. In fact, Hendrick Motorsports as a whole is pretty good out there. They've got a combined 12 victories, so anyone from that stable could go to victory lane. Finally, keep an eye on Tyler Reddick. It seems like he's very comfortable at that racetrack. He proved that last year, leading a race high 90 laps. Well, that's all for this week. We appreciate you tuning in to Cup Connection. Thanks for watching. Feel free to check out our other videos and don't forget to smack that subscribe button down below while you're at it. Also, for more great and original content, head right over to bbmsports.com.